We're in our series, His Benefits, talking about God's benefits. Psalms 103, verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Now, notice it doesn't say it's your benefits. It says they're His benefits. Why? Because His benefits are there to empower you to fulfill His purpose in your life. You see, in America, we're all about ownership. I own this. This is mine. We grew up, come out of the birth canal basically saying mine, <laughs> right? Stingy. We know how to be stingy. But when we can become born again, the Bible says that you were bought with a price. You are not your own. So what that means is, is it's no longer in an ownership mentality. When you become born again, you're now a stewardship. You merely oversee and become responsible with whatever God entrusts you with. Amen. If you're married, you're responsible for your for uh, your marriage, and you're responsible for your kids, and you're responsible for your finances. Why? Because when you get born again, He wants to redeem your marriage. He wants to redeem your family, your finances, all of it, for His purpose, for His glory and honor. Amen. Amen. And today I want to talk about in verse three. It says, "Who heals all your diseases." who heals all of your diseases. Do you realize that there are many different sections, I could say that, of churches that do not cotton well to healing? They, they don't agree that God is still healing people today. They might agree that it happened in the Bible because it's in the Bible. What do you do with that, right? But what they want to do is say that, well, healing is no longer for today. Interesting. Because I know myself, I've been divinely healed by the power of God. Anybody else? Anybody else? Can you testify of the healing power of God in your life? See, I, it's interesting because many of the uh, denominations that do not accept signs and wonders and miracles for today or speaking in other tongues, things like that, those that don't embrace it, what they're finding is those denominations are actually in a regressive state in the mission field. They find that they are not taking ground like the spirit-filled Pentecostal Christian uh, charismatics, the word of faith. They're, they're, They're not accomplishing and seeing people born again and transformed like they are in the spirit-filled circles. And that's because when you deny that God is still interacting with us today, you're denying his power and his goodness and his benefits. Healing is a benefit of God. God don't want you sick. Does God want you broke? No. Oh, you're good with that. Does God want you sick? No. Well, maybe he's trying to teach you something. That's why he gave you cancer. No. Have you heard thinking like that? Have you heard people say stuff like that? Well, God, the Lord's just trying to teach me something. Well, why don't you learn it? <laughs> God's not going to give you disease and sickness to try to teach you a lesson. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. God is is still God, the same God in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. Exodus 15, 26 says, I, the Lord, am your healer. So what that means is God is not bipolar. He's not schizophrenic. He doesn't have an identity crisis. He doesn't flip-flop and change his mind. God is God, and he changes not. He says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that means if he's the healer in the Old Testament, he's still the healer in the New Testament. He don't change. And this is where people get in trouble is when they try to uh, interpret Scripture apart from the character and the nature of God. You see, you can't understand the Word of God if you don't understand the character and the nature of God. If you understand that God is a good God, and if you understand that there's no sickness or disease in heaven... How could there possibly be his will for us to have sickness and disease on this earth? Because he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God doesn't want you to have sickness. God doesn't want you to have disease. He didn't give it to you. He didn't bring it to you. He's not trying to mess with your head. You're not his little science project. You're not the little frog that's going to be filleted open and let's see what's in here. He loves you. He cares about you. And he wants to empower you to believe that he is your healer today. You just happen to be in one of those churches. 
We're one of those crazy churches that believes that God heals, that he still interacts with us here and now. I'm not into that. Well, God's out there and I'm over here. and I've got my little book and I'll figure it out. Well, let's see. If you take all of the supernatural stuff, all the signs and the wonders and, and all of the spiritual breakthroughs that God has done, and if you just take all of that out of the Bible, what do you have left? Because three quarters in the New Testament is dealing with signs, wonders, and miracles. And you might as well just pull out all the gospels. Well, that was Jesus. And where's Jesus now? Now, it's interesting, Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. How many? Every. Now, it's interesting, I went through uh, there in uh, Psalms 103, 3, where it says, he heals all your diseases, and I did an exhaustive word study on the word all. I went through the Hebrew, the Aramaic, the Greek. Uh, I went through the study of several other theologians, the entomology of the word all. And this is really interesting what I found out about the word all here in this context. It means all. (laughs) Thank God for the simplicity of his word. Amen? Amen? Thank God that it's not something deeper than all. I heal all, your, that, that was your, that's your fill in the blank. You ready? He heals all, all. your sickness, all. your disease, all. your problems, all. if you have faith. That was mine. Don't take mine. <laughs> but it's interesting because then people will come along and say, well, you know, Jesus couldn't do very many miracles in his own hometown, though. You're right. He did heal some people. There were some cool things that Jesus was able to do, but very few was he able to do. Why? Because the Bible says it's because of their unbelief. You see, God is working through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's a gentleman, and the Holy Spirit is not going to override your will. If you don't believe that God can heal you, he's not going to heal you. Why? Because it's up to you. Okay, can, can we just get down to brass tacks? Jesus comes back to his hometown. Signs, wonders, miracles, power of God manifests. He's in his ministry, and here he comes back to his hometown. You know anything about hometowns, small towns? I grew up in a small town, Tyner, Indiana. It was such a small town, we put a mirror at the end just to make it look bigger. (laughs) You understand what I'm talking about? We, We didn't have a fire department, we just had a big dog. Right? And the town drunk and the mayor was the same person. We just consolidated because we lived in a small town. When you're in a small town, you know everything about everyone. You know everybody's business. Did I say that right? Business? You know everybody's business. Why? Because it's a small town. Everybody just talks and blah, blah, blah. And did you know? And matter of fact, when we moved there, that's when party lines were really popular. Know what a party line is? Yeah. You need to tell some of the youth and the children what a party line is, where you you would have people get on the phone and listen to other people's conversation because you're sharing the same phone system in the town. Well, in Jesus' town, there was a party line. And come on, come on, let's just read past past the word. It doesn't contradict with the word. Just Let's just go a little bit deeper into it. Can you hear the talk of the town? Oh, here comes Jesus, you know, so-called Messiah. We know, we know he ain't got no daddy. We know, we know Joseph ain't his real daddy. We know she got knocked up. We know she got pregnant, and we don't know who the daddy is. Hmm? See, they humanized him. And they degraded him and they, they tore his, his image down to this level that put him in the gutter. And therefore, it limited his ability to do good. Why? Because of lack of faith. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's not a lack of willingness. He went there. Yeah. I want you to turn over into John. And we're going to pick the account up here. I think it's verse 9. No. Uh, John 11. We're going to be talking about the account of Lazarus, Lazarus being healed. And I just want us to walk through this briefly 
Because we need to understand the heart of Christ, the heart of the Father, that he is still healing people today. Now, we pick it up in verse 5. It says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister, Mary, and Lazarus. Martha and Mary were the sisters of Lazarus. Lazarus was their brother. Okay? Now, you could go back and you could probably figure this out through reading and understanding that Mary and Martha were not married. And that's not a good thing, especially back in those days. Because ladies, back then, you couldn't own property. You couldn't make decisions. There, there was a lot of things. that It was almost like you were, you were property, and it was wrong. And so what had happened was they became under the care of their brother, Lazarus. That was their future. That's how they were able to eat and sustain their life under Lazarus. So Lazarus became ill. And when Lazarus became ill, Jesus found out about it, but he stayed two days longer where he was ministering. In other words, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he didn't drop everything and go, oh, I got to go pray for Lazarus and heal him. He stayed two days longer. Now, that sounds very dismissive. Sounds like he's kind of cold and cruel and uncaring. Hmm? And then verse 11, it says, after saying these things, he said to the disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'll go and awake him. And the disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they had thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. So then Jesus told him plainly. In other words, he says, hey, guys, come here, come here. You don't get it. He's dead, <laughs> right? He's belly up, pushing up daisies. He croaked. It's over. <laughs> dead, like a fish. And then, oh, okay, because they all understood that. They were fishermen. Like, oh, like a fish. <laughs> But he said, I like this. He says, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there. Yeah. What? Now, this really sounds mean. For Jesus to be able to say to the disciples, Lazarus died, and I'm glad I wasn't there to save him. Now, look at this. I want, I want you to see this because you need to see beyond what you're hearing right now. There's something bigger and something greater that God wants to do in your life than what you see with your natural eye. So many times we sell the power of God short. He said this, he said, for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. Why? Why is he saying that? Because the simple fact is they, they thought he was a rabbi. They thought he was a good teacher. They thought he was a well-educated man, maybe even a prophet, but they really didn't believe that he was the son of God living with the power of God. And so what is he doing? He's saying, now you're going to know. This healing stuff, oh, you got healing faith, but you don't have resurrection faith. Mm. Some of us, we need to get out of the healing faith and move into resurrection faith. You need to move past. Well, my marriage is dead. No, it's not. Not when you got resurrection faith. My business is dead. No, you don't. It is not dead. It is not gone when you got resurrection faith. Why? Because sometimes what you're believing for isn't big enough. It's not big enough to glorify God. You got your little prayer card and da da da. And oh Lord, I'm praying for this. And when this comes past, praise the Lord. And then it gets past the deadline. And now your little promise and your little hope died. And then you get upset. <laughs> Have you ever seen, I, I know we don't do circuses much anymore, but uh, if you've seen anything of circuses, you'll see the lion tamer. He's in the cage and, and here's this four-legged beast. And sometimes there's three or four of them in the same cage. And, and these beasts, they're, they're several hundred pounds, maybe four or five hundred pounds. And they're just nothing but muscle and teeth. And, and so... God designed them to be flesh eaters. They're predators. They, they're designed to kill. And we put them in this cage with a 150-pound man with a little whip. Weak, weak. And we tame this huge beast. How is this possible? Well, what you may not know and what you may be looking past is it's interesting how they make the lions stand on these little three-legged stools. 
Now the beast is no longer concerning himself about how he's going to attack the man with the whip. All he can do is use his tail and work out to keep his balance on that three-legged stool. He's preoccupied with just standing. He's preoccupied. Therefore, this little man that has no power to contain this amazing beast sits there and puts this beast under its con- his control. And how many of us are standing on our little three-legged stool of fear and doubt and pain? And we're just standing there and we're afraid to move because we, you know, we're, we're, we're in torment and we're scared. And yet the devil's right there and all we need to do is speak the name of Jesus. Verse 17 says, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus was already in the tomb for four days. And Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Verse 20, so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and she met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Jesus is coming. Martha went. Where's Mary? She's sitting in the house. She's ticked. She's upset. I don't, I don't want to see him. He should have been here four days ago. He should have healed my brother. And now he's coming, and now he thinks it's going to be okay. Isn't it amazing how big we can talk when we're not confronted with the reality of who God is? Oh, we're just so tough. Come on. She's upset because God missed her deadline. Her hopes are dashed. Her life is over as she knows it. So finally, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Woo! She gave him a piece of her mind. Mm, mm, mm. Ladies know how to do that. Yes, we do. Hallelujah. I've had many pieces of that mind. My cup overfloweth. (laughs) Lord, if you had been here. Lord, if you would have done this. Lord, if you would have done that. I'd still have my job. I'd still have my husband. I'd still have my baby. But even now, I, I know whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. You see, many times we get upset because a miracle seems like it's delayed. It's, it's past our deadline. <laughs> but a miracle delayed is merely nothing more than a setup of God's glory to crush the enemy. You understand? Because what you were believing for won't even move a net. God's like, you, you're believing me for that? That's not faith. That's flesh. That's the strength of your arm. That's, that's what you think is possible. You got to get into my area where man thinks it's impossible, but with me, I can do all things. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And she goes, well, I know he's going to rise on, on the resurrection day. But Jesus said, whoa, you don't get it, sister. I am the resurrection. This isn't going to be resurrection day one day. I am the resurrection, and resurrection is now. They're not, they're not getting it. And she goes, I, I do believe that you're Christ, the Son of God who's coming into the world. They're just not getting it. They don't see who he is. The resurrecting power is right here, right now, ready to raise him. The, the, the problem is solved. Lazarus is going to come out of that tomb. It's already determined Jesus is there, but they could not see it. So when she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher's here and is calling for you. (laughs) And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. (laughs) You understand what I'm talking about? I'm going to give him peace of my mind. Right? You got to remember, they they really didn't see him for who he was yet. And now Jesus had not come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly to go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to go to the tomb and weep. No, she was going to go to Jesus and give him peace of her mind. 
Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and she saw him, oh, something changed. You understand? Something changed. I'm going to give him a piece of my mouth. <laughs> and she crumbled and she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mm. She just corrected Jesus. She just corrected. I just want you to know, if somebody gets mad at God, you don't need to defend God. That's why he's God. He don't need you to defend him. And you know what? God knows the state of the heart and the state of the mind of whatever somebody's going through. And you know, sometimes we're just not in our right mind. Sometimes we're just not thinking correctly. And thank God we've got people around us to give us the room to grow and learn and come through it. You see, Jesus saw her weeping. And the Jews had come with her, were weeping. Oh, my goodness. Nothing, nothing moves a man's heart more than a woman weeping. <laughs> don't cry, please, don't cry. Come on, how many men know what I'm talking about? I mean, when the waterworks come on, we're like, what do I do to plug this? Stop this, leave. What do I do to, how do I fix this? <laughs> right? Because tears, there's no arguing with tears. Tears win all the time. You're right, you're right. It was just me. <laughs> and what had happened? He said, where'd you lay him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Now, I've heard people say, well, Jesus was weeping because he missed Lazarus, and Lazarus was such a good friend, and he's dead. And then I hear other people, well, he's full of such compassion that he's crying and weeping because everybody else is crying and weeping. Hogwash. You know, the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. Yeah. And, and the resurrection and the life is right there, right in their sight, right, ready, to, ready to move, ready to intervene, ready to do, bring the resurrecting power. And everybody's crying, oh, it's so bad. <laughs> and what's Jesus doing? He's weeping because he's like, these people do not get it. Yeah. You want to know what makes the father weep? Lack of faith distrust in God's ability, his will, and his power. <laughs> so the Jews said, oh, do you see how Jesus loved him because he's weeping? And then they said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept also this man from dying? <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to choke somebody. <laughs> I'm right there with Jesus, like, people don't get this. <laughs> and then Jesus deeply moved again. He came to the tomb, and he was at the cave, and he's wiping his tears away, and he goes, all right, take away the stone. Wah, wah, wah. You understand? Ching, ching, ching. It's high noon, buddy. Take away the stone. The enemy's going down. Hmm? <laughs> Take away the stone. What is blocking you from your resurrecting power? What's standing in your way? Who put something there you think is immovable? Who said lies into your life, trying to condemn you as a child, trying to molest you or hurt you or rape you or violate you, and that stone's been setting in your pathway, and you think you can't get out of your tomb? But today, he said, I'm taking away the stone. Yeah. And Martha, <laughs> here's Martha again. <laughs> oh, Martha. The sister of the dead man. I like how, how, how he said this. <laughs> Martha, the sister of the dead man, loved by, or, or said, Lord, by this time there's going to be an odor because he's been in there for four days. Now I want you to know, when somebody dies, the body starts to stink. Decay, it's full of fluids. I mean, they don't embalm like they embalm. My dad, a retired pastor now, also did embalming on the side. And I tell you what, we have wonderful dinner stories. <laughs> oh, yeah, really? His leg fell off. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, you stitched him up, right? He didn't say anything, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, what? Isn't that good? Lori's like, oh, do we have to hear this again? <laughs> I 
<laughs> Your life too, right? I mean, you know, he's, he's dead. He stinks. You know what? Martha wasn't really saying that he stinks. She's saying this whole situation stinks. Jesus, this whole thing stinks. How many of us are coming to God saying, this stinks, this ain't right, this isn't good. I don't like what's going on here. Some of you, you've had hopes, you've had dreams, you've had expectations that you put before God and now those things are dead and they're gone, but you have no idea that the Lord of the resurrection is there to bring it back to life if you'll just have faith. Hmm. Jesus said this, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? There, there's a tie between the glory and faith. You see, we can quote Philippians 4.19 until we're blue in the face. But my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. And what we focus on is my needs. My needs, my needs, my needs, my needs, my needs. I have wants, I have desires. We focus on me, 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 me. But the reality is, is the needs are only met in the, I'll repeat it again. But my God shall meet all or supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. So where is the supply to my needs at? In glory. In glory. If you got no faith, you will never see the glory of God manifest. Without faith, without your belief in God's word, the glory of God will never manifest and you'll never see the miracle and the breakthrough and the resurrection power. Amen. Come on. But they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around me, all these numbskulls around me that are weeping and crying. You, you understand? This isn't about pity. If you think pity is of the kingdom of God, you are sorely mistaken. So many people want to rest in their pity. Oh, you have no idea what I've been through. You have no idea the pain I've suffered. You, yeah, really, really, I believe it. Because I think we all been through stuff. We all been through pain. We all been through hell and back. Come on, when are you going to quit talking about what you've been through and what you're going to go through with God? When are you going to let it go and get out of your self-pity and holding woe is me and not grabbing on to the power and resurrection life? And what did he do? When he got done praying, he said, Lazarus! Y'all listen? <laughs> come out here. In the King James, he said, come forth. Just sounds better in King James, don't it? <laughs> come forth. Right? You a little rumble in there. The devil always submits to the King James, just so you know. <laughs> if it ain't working, get in the King James. <laughs> come forth, come out. How many of you need to come out of your tombs? Your tombs. You've been in a tomb of sickness. You've been in a tomb of disease. You've been in a tomb held with blindness and, and fear and depression. It is time for you to come out. The Lord of the resurrection is saying, come out. At a monastery, a, a young boy went to the Christian monk, the Papa, and he said, um, he said, Padre, he said, I, I was reading in the word, the holy word, and he said, I don't understand what it is saying that we are to be crucified in our flesh. I, I don't understand what it means to be dead in Christ. And he says, uh, son, I, I don't know that I could explain it. But he said, you know, Brother Michael, he passed away last week, and he's out buried in the cemetery. He says, what I want you to do is go out there, and I want you to stand over Brother Michael's tomb grave, and... I want you to confess all of the wonderful things that you've heard about him, all the great accolades and great compliments. And, and then I just want you to keep going. Just make stuff up. Just really, really build his ego. And the little boy says, okay. So he goes out and he does it and he comes back and he says, Padre, Padre, I did it. And he goes, well, what did Brother Michael say? How did he respond? And he goes, he didn't. He's dead. Hmm. He said, I tell you what, I want you to go out tomorrow morning and I want you to stand over Brother Michael's grave and I want you to say every evil, vile thing that you've heard people say about him. 
And then I, I just want you to add stuff. Just make it up. And just really rile him up and just say the worst things that you could possibly say. And I want you to come back and let me know how it went. So the young boy, he came back and he said, I did it. And he goes, the Padre said, um, what, did, what did Brother Mike, Michael do? Nothing. And the Padre said to the boy, he said, you see, that's what it means to be crucified in your flesh. When somebody comes and tries to insult you and hurt you and cut you, you're not affected. When somebody tries to build your ego and stroke your ego and, and, and try to push you into pride, you're not affected because your flesh is dead and unresponsive. The thing that blocks our eyes of faith is our flesh. It's the image that we hold in our mind. I, I don't know what football team, and I don't know how they were able to do this, but they took a football team, all of the members, and they sat them down individually. And because they had gone through, you know, their blood tests and urine samples and all that, they sat down with them and they said to each individual, you have a disease. You've been diagnosed with this disease, and here are the symptoms of that disease. And every single football, it wasn't true, but every single football team member was exhibiting those symptoms within two days. Why? Because they allowed that image to come into their mind and accept it. That's why we are to cast down every imagination that tries to exalt itself against the name of Jesus. Any image that says you can't be healed, curse it in the name of Jesus. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Any image that has been in your head, you're going to be this way the rest of your life. It's genetic. It's in your genes. It's hereditary. You're going to have to deal with this and struggle with this. This is going to be your outcome. You need to curse it and cast it down in Jesus' name. You cannot afford to respond to it. There are sometimes I get some really bad news as a pastor. And some people might think I am disengaged or uncaring or unaffected. I like the latter, unaffected. I don't want my flesh to get in the way of my spirit man listening to the voice of the Father on how I'm going to deal with a situation and how we're going to come through it. God has given you the power to be healed by faith. But you have to activate it. But there's no greater faith than saving faith. And if you can get born again, you can get healed. Matter of fact, I just want you to know that Jesus healed more non-Christians than anybody. Well, I'm not good enough. Well, you just come to the Lord's table and he's going to bless you and he's going to show you his love. Even though you don't think you deserve it, he's just going to say, here's my healing power. I want to show you my goodness. But if you're here today and you're not born again and you're not serving Jesus Christ, you need your spirit man healed. Because right now, if you're not born again, you're dead to Christ. You're dead to God. He does not hear your prayers. But God loves you so much that while you were yet a sinner, while I was a sinner, he sent his son Jesus to die for me. And now that I'm born again, I'm no longer a sinner. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> what are you today? It's interesting how many people have what we might call demon faith. Well, I, I believe there's a God. I believe Jesus died for us. The Bible says even the devil and his angels believe, but they tremble. It's not enough just to acknowledge some biblical facts. God wants all of you. All of you. It's gonna, it, it may be free to get born again, but it will cost you everything. I'm not going to give you some easy check mark this box and you're good to go. I don't want you to get uh, this, this false assumption about what salvation is. It means planting your life in the house of God and, and, and endeavoring to live for Christ as he strengthens you and empowers you. So 
I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. And if you're here today and you're not born again, you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Or maybe you've drifted away and you've, you've been on your own course. But you know it's time to come home and recommit your life to Christ. This is the biggest decision of your life. And you're not here by accident. This is a divine intervention right here, right now. The Spirit of God is knocking on your heart's door. So if that's you and you want to be born again or renew your relationship with Christ, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, I'm going to just clap my hand. And I want you to shoot your hand up with me. And we're going to pray with you right where you're at. Spirit of God is wrestling with you right now. If that's you. Here it is. One, you want to come back to Christ or come to Christ for the very first time. Two, three, anyone at all? Yes, I see that hand. Anyone else looking in the balcony? Yes, I see that hand, that hand, that hand. There's four. Anyone else? All right, church, let's stand. All of us, let's stand. Now, here's the deal. Jesus said, if you'll confess me before others, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before others, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. This isn't some kind of bait and switch. This is the word of God. He said, if you can't acknowledge him, and if you can't do it here, you'll never be able to do it out there. And so this is what it's going to look like. In just a moment, I'm going to invite the four of you that raised your hands to come and meet me right here. We're going to pray a very powerful, simple prayer to lead you in front of all of these witnesses, not to embarrass you, but to empower you. To empower you. Amen? And then we have a special gift that we want to give you. All right? So here it is. Come now. Go ahead. You come. You raise your hand. Come. Right now. Don't delay. Come on. Come right now. Biggest decision of your life. Come on. Right on. Come on down. Come on down. Just come on down right here, shoulder to shoulder. Everybody, come on. It's all right. This is awesome. Right on. You're here for a purpose, for a destiny. Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord. Come on out. Yes. We're going to pray this very simple prayer, okay? Everybody just close your eyes, bow your heads. And I want you to make this your prayer, okay? Dear Jesus, come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Every one of them. Even the ones I don't even remember. They're erased under your blood, Jesus. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. And live in me as I live for you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.